Today I'm learning about when Britain nuked America twice. That's that's not very comforting. Live long and prosper, Britain. Perhaps the USAF was no. determined. I'm afraid to continue with this video. Hello everybody. Roger says hey. So I've had quite a few requests to do this video. It's actually a really interesting one because when you read the title, you're like, what? Obviously, Britain has a nuclear program, but other than just knowing that Britain has one, I don't know anything about it. I don't know how many nukes they have. I don't know the ins and outs of the program, when it started, I don't know where it is today. I have had a lot of you on particularly like my Queen video that I did when we talked about the powers of the Queen, saying that she basically has the same powers that the US president does. She has her finger on the nuclear button, and so Britain can shoot off their nukes at her command. Obviously, we're allies, so we're not going to be nuking each other anytime soon. So when I think about this video, there has to be like some trickery going on here with the title, obviously. The only thing I can think of really is if it was like a war game exercise where Britain kind of got the upper hand on the US and was somehow able to nuke us. But I also think I remember seeing that Britain did test nukes over here in the US, so that might also be what it's about. But there's only one way to find out, and that's to watch the video. So let's do it. Dramatic. In the 1960s, Great Britain nuked the United States not once, but twice. Fortunately for all concerned, the attacks were only training exercises, but so embarrassing okay. were these attacks that they were hidden from the American public for about 50 years as well as being okay. strenuously denied to the American press for decades. As so it is a training exercise, kind of like what I thought, like a war games situation where they got the better of us. That's, that's not very comforting, actually. As well as being strenuously denied to the American press for decades. As far as America was concerned, its defenses were 99% effective. But in simulated attacks, Royal Air Force bombers managed to penetrate U.S. airspace to launch nuclear attacks on New York City and several other important urban centers. Before I tell you how, a word from our sponsor. How did the British manage to penetrate the world's most heavily defended airspace? Yeah, well, obviously it's not the most heavily defended airspace if you're able to get through it, is it? I have to tell you that this is really, really concerning. How did the British manage to penetrate the world's most heavily defended airspace? The answer is surprisingly simple and consists of two words. Sure it is. Avro Vulcan. The Vulcan first flew in 1952, the team that created it led by Roy Chadwick, who had designed the famous Lancaster Heavy Bomber of World War II. A jet-powered, tailless, delta-wing, high-altitude strategic bomber, the Vulcan was the backbone of Britain's nuclear airborne deterrent during most of the Cold War, serving from 1956 until retirement in 1984. I have to say, as a Star Trek fan, I approve of the name of this plane. I, I can't do the symbol, but you know. I can't do it. So as close as I'm gonna get, live long and prosper. Britain? This is the story of Exercise Sky Shield, when Britain nuked its closest ally, exposing how the Soviet Union could have done the same for real. In 1960, the United States decided to run the largest test of its air defenses in history. Exercise Sky Shield 1 occurred on the 10th of September 1960, and all commercial air traffic over the US and Canada was grounded, amounting to a thousand US commercial flights and 700 general aviation aircraft, plus a further wow. 31 foreign flights due to land in North America. 
I didn't know that they had grounded all of uh, the airspace, basically. I know the only other time I know that that happened was on 9-11, when they grounded all planes. They made a big deal about it back then, too. Like, this is the first time that, you know, all air traffic has been completely grounded in the U.S., but I didn't know that, that, that uh, it had happened back then as well. Plus, a further 31 foreign flights due to land in North America. It's a lot America. less flights, though, back in the 60s. The U.S. Strategic Air Command would launch B-52 Strato Fortresses and B-47 Strato Jets to simulate a massive Soviet nuclear bomber force approaching North America from north and south. 360 U.S. interceptor aircraft stood ready to defeat these enemy aircraft, which numbered 310. Among those 310 aircraft were eight Royal Air Force Vulcan B-2 nuclear bombers. A flight of four flew from Scotland, while the other four launched from the British territory of Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean. The American plan was to detect these enemy bombers by radar and other early warning systems. And then they would be intercepted and destroyed in simulated attacks by U.S. jet fighters and missile batteries. The attacking bombers split their attacks between high and low altitude. The defending fighters did very well against the stratojets and strato fortresses, intercepting many of them, but the Vulcans proved more elusive opponents. The Vulcan flew at the highest altitude of the simulated Soviet bombers, cruising at 56,000 feet. One was successfully intercepted at this altitude over Goose Bay, Labrador, by a United States Air Force F-101 Voodoo. But the other seven Vulcans all managed to penetrate American airspace to launch simulated bombing attacks on U.S. cities. They then turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. Of course. The question was, how had the Vulcan managed it? The answer was their highly advanced electronic countermeasures systems and the Vulcan's amazing maneuverability. For example, the flight of four aircraft that approached from Bermuda were successful because three of them put up a wall of electronic interference that prevented interception, while the fourth Vulcan carried out a simulated nuclear strike. So this kind of was stealth. all rather embarrassing for Strategic Air Command, which quickly buried yeah. all stories about British bombers having nuked U.S. targets and confidently assured the American public that U.S. air defenses were, as I said, 99% effective. Yeah, see, this is one of those things that you grow up as an American. You listen to just how great our military is and how impenetrable it is how safe we are over here because we have the two oceans on either side. Obviously, that's not, you know, 100% accurate because, you know, this happened. And then also, I referred back to this also in one of my previous videos. I think I, I talked about, you know, 9-11 too. Like, I literally grew up with with that talk of we we can't be you know, bombed here on the homeland or whatever. And then 9-11 happens. And then that was like one of the scariest things about it was because we had all been brought up to think that something like that wouldn't happen here on American soil. And then it does. And you realize you're not as safe as you thought you were. But yeah, uh, I didn't know about this either, which has me worried now even because I think even today, Americans feel relatively safe. We feel like we have the top military in the world. We have the top defenses, you know, and I suppose strategically we are fairly safe over here compared to a lot of countries. Obviously, we're not 100% safe. I've actually watched documentaries on 9-11 and just how confused the military was and air traffic controllers were about what was going on and they couldn't scramble things quick enough to defend the country. And so you just, you see things like that, you see things like this right here and you realize that, you know, you know, something actually could happen here. I don't know. It's like a wake-up call, really. I think it's, it's probably dangerous to get a little bit too prideful, a little bit too complacent in your country's ability to defend itself or whatever, because it's when you think that you are invincible, it's usually when you're taken down. However, the following year, the Americans invited the RAF to take part in Exercise Sky Shield 2, 
Perhaps the USAF was no. determined to show that the Vulcan's previous success was only a fluke, a one-time only event. Oh, no. Sky He's, Shield 2, which going? occurred on the 14th of August 1961, was an even bigger event than the first one. It oh, caused 2,900 US and Canadian flights to be grounded, affecting 125,000 commercial passengers. During the exercise, 125 US and British bombers would be pitted against 1,800 fighters and 250 missile sites, and over 200,000 Air Force personnel from the US and Canada. I'm kind of confused about who's seconds. who, though. Who's the allies and who are the enemies? Yeah, but I'm still ready. Ready. Now. Is that a, a B-52? Those Where's things are still in service, aren't they? Come up. It's amazing that they've been in service all these decades, too. Again, Eight Vulcan B-2s participated, split again into two flights. One attacking on the northern route from RAF Lossiemouth in Scotland via Canada. And the other four aircraft on a southerly route from Kindley Air Force Base Bermuda. The B-47 Stratojets simulated low-level Soviet bombers. The B-52s would attack between 35,000 and 42,000 feet, while the Vulcans again operated at the highest altitude, 56,000 feet. At the massive NORAD, or North American Air Defense Bunker, at Colorado Springs, the U.S. top brass was joined by the RAF's Air Marshal Sir Kenneth Cross of Bomber Command and Sir Wallace Kyle, Chief of the RAF Technical Training Command, to monitor the exercise. See, NORAD is what I had in mind here. I was thinking, don't we have satellites and radar to let us know way before anything gets to our shores, you know, that something is coming. And I think most Americans believe that that will keep us safe, that we will intercept whatever it is coming towards us way before it gets here and prevent an attack on the U.S. home soil. Okay, so now I know that NORAD is doing that. I'm afraid to continue with this video because <laughs> I have a feeling that, well, then Britain knew us twice, right? So this is the second time. Just before 2 p.m., U.S. interceptors pounced on the B-52s, approaching at the mid to high altitude level. The Vulcans also came in from the north, and again, due to the Vulcans' high-tech jamming equipment, only one was shot down by an F-101 Voodoo fighter. In fact, large numbers of U.S. fighters were scrambled but they concentrated almost exclusively on the B-52s. When the Vulcans came over, the interceptors did not have sufficient fuel remaining to climb to 56,000 feet plus and engage them. The surviving three Vulcans conducted their attacks successfully, turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. The turned around and landed and yeah. Um... Okay, so first time this happened, obviously the Vulcans are the ones that came in and did the attacks. They knew that they were coming. Well, the second time, they knew that that was going to happen again. They knew they're going to be high altitude. Like, why were they not ready for that? It's almost like they, they weren't ready and then they had to like go suddenly intercept them or something. And I know they had like radar jamming technology, so maybe they didn't know exactly where they were. But I think I would have had planes like at that altitude or something ready to intercept. Maybe I don't understand what's going on here completely, but honestly, to me, it just sounds like we were being stupid in a nutshell. The southern attack force of four Vulcans from Bermuda reached a position 50 miles off the U.S. coast before fighters were scrambled to intercept. Again, three of the Vulcans unleashed an electronic jamming screen that kept the attacking F-102 Delta daggers busy while the fourth aircraft crept round to the north and sneaked through. So did the Brits have stealth technology with their Air Force before the uh, United States did? 
because that's kind of what it sounds like here. Yeah, this is interesting. Actually, I, I would like to know more about, because uh, stealth technology in um, planes really fascinates me. And I've actually seen, you know, videos of like the F-35 and the new technology that they have and stuff. It's really, really interesting to me. I like to learn more about it. But this is, uh, I like to know more about the history of stealth technology in planes because it sounds like just from this video, it sounds like the Brits definitely had the upper hand to the United States back in the 60s anyway with uh, stealth technology. And obviously this is um, not quite the same technology as we have today, but it's kind of the start of it. This Vulcan proceeded to land at Plattsburgh Air Force Base in New York. If this had been a real attack, New York City could have been reduced to a smoking, irradiated hole in the ground. I could just see these Vulcan planes with like the thug life glasses on, just flying around with the music going in the background. Pretty much sums up this video. It is a cool looking plane though. It looks, much, it looks like a bird. Many of these stratojets and strato fortresses had also managed to evade interception and launch simulated nuclear attacks, but not at the kind of success rate that the Vulcans enjoyed. In two massive exercises of eight Vulcans that attacked on each occasion, seven had got through to their targets, an astounding survival rate against the huge might of the US air defenses. Yeah, well, it doesn't sound like it's such a huge might back then. Maybe we just, we had a lot, we had a lot of uh, brawn here, not a lot of brains, it sounds like, going on. The Vulcans show that with the right aircraft, America could be laid wide open to a nation-ending assault, something which the Soviet Union would have been very interested in. Fortunately for all concerned, the relationship between Britain and the United States never changed from special to decidedly antagonistic, and yeah. the Vulcans never came in anger. The American government also tried to make damn sure that nobody ever found out about the Vulcans nuking American cities. The US Air Force was very quick to deny rumors that RAF planes had once again successfully penetrated US airspace. In fact, the US government went so far as to classify all references to Vulcans included in the Sky Shield exercises. After all, if the RAF could practice nuke New York City, Washington DC, and even Chicago, the Soviets could do the same, if they could develop an aircraft as good as the Vulcan. As far as strategic air command was concerned, the Vulcan episodes had never happened and the U.S. was well protected, and that protection, as I said, 99% effective. The Vulcans' successful attacks on America were only fully declassified in 1997, long after the Vulcan had left British service. Hmm. I was wondering about that, if they were still being Many thanks used for watching. Not. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. That was a good video. Go visit Mark Felton's channel. There's a link to this um, video in the description of uh, this video. So, okay, well, wow. Um, you know, I think there's this thing where a lot of people around the world say, well, thank God we are the allies of the U.S. and not their enemy because, you know, the United States military is kind of known for being, I guess, the most powerful in the world. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of it. But after watching this video, I have to say, thank God the Britain is our ally because obviously they could probably come over here and nuke us if they wanted to. Or at least they could in the 60s. I don't know, you know, how things are now, if things have changed at all i probably not but yeah it is really scary to think about like i said in the video as an american you're raised to believe that you're like one of the safest countries in the world and uh yeah i had no idea that this happened i'm sure most americans have no idea that it happened so i have to say kudos to the royal air force and your vulcan plane i would like to watch some more videos on the vulcan plane it looks like a very interesting plane to learn about the shape of it Kind of reminded me of the Concorde a little bit, if you guys remember that. I don't know, maybe it doesn't look like the Concorde, but it just gave me flashbacks to the Concorde for some reason. But I would like to learn more about its um, like stealth 
technology that it was using, how it came to be, when it came to be, and so forth. So also I have to say I'm really thankful that the British at least did those joint exercises with us because it helped us sort of strengthen our defenses but not really because they did it again a second time so but you know what it's good to have very capable people doing these war games exercises with because you want to go up against the best and i know that britain and the united states enjoys you know these joint exercises even today so i'm glad that we're helping each other out but man this um has me second guessing our actual defense capabilities here. Like I said, along with 9-11 too, you know, that just, that makes you question it as well. And obviously the planes used in 9-11 weren't even, you know, they were commercial jet liners. So yeah, I think the takeaway from this is to, you know, as an American, you can't get too big for your britches. Yes, we have a strong military, but it's not impenetrable. Our nation is not impenetrable. You can't be complacent. You can't think you're so much better than everybody else that nothing is going to happen to you because that is probably not the case. So anyway, thanks to everybody who suggested this video to me. It was very interesting and it gave me a few more tangents to go off on that I'd like to, you know, learn more about. So if you could enlighten me on any of my questions that I had in this video or if you just know a little bit more information that you'd like to add please do that down in the comments and if you enjoyed this video make sure you like and subscribe we're gonna have more content like this coming your way because I would like to learn a lot more about like military equipment and stuff like that and also just you know the UK in general you're definitely keeping us on our toes Britain that's for sure so anyway thanks for watching and Roger and I will see you next time